This recording is for the week of Thanksgiving, so we'll just be going over chapter 23 this week. Next week we'll be finishing up the material by going over some selections from chapter 24 through 26. Mostly we'll focus on 25. This chapter is about the nervous system. You'll be responsible for material in sections 1 through 3, 7, and 17 through 18. You'll be focusing on what the nervous system is in general, how neurons work, how our senses detect and transmit stimuli using our nervous system, and we'll talk about some of the regions of the brain. The nervous system is one of the many critical systems in the human body and the body of other animals. The system sends messages from our sensory system to our spinal cord and then brain, which triggers an action response. In total, it, like many other systems, helps us react and survive in our environment. So why do we need a nervous system? Well, partly it's to respond to our environment. Even if we feel pain, we need to be able to respond to that. It's pretty important. You might think that pain is negative, so why would we want to be able to feel it? But not being able to feel it has negative consequences. So yeah, feeling pain is unpleasant, but there are individuals that have disorders where they are unable to feel pain. An example here is this little girl, Gabby. She was born without the ability to feel pain, and this is a condition that actually puts her at great risk. Pain is a necessary part of being a living animal, so think about if you put your hand near something very hot, you immediately feel pain because of that stimulus that gets sent as information to your brain, your brain then responds for your muscles and your hand to let go of whatever it is that's hot that you were touching. If you couldn't receive that information like Gabby can't receive it, you'd just keep your hand there until you smelled burning flesh. By that point, you may have done irreparable damage. So feeling pain is something that you want to be able to do. So I just gave you an example with that pain response, how the nervous system functions. It has three primary functions. First, it receives stimuli. So in the case of the, let's say a hot pan, okay? So in the case of the hot pan, you'd receive the stimulus of this is hot. The nervous system collects that information about that external environment. That stimulus then gets sent as information to your brain the nervous system would then process that information. It'll interpret the incoming stimuli and determine an appropriate response to go back out. And then you would initiate a response by sending signals to muscles and glands to respond to the hot pan, in this case, the muscles in your hand to let go of it. So let's look at that example with Gabby. She cannot feel pain. So her nervous system is unable to perform which of these three? functions. Pause the video if you need to. The answer is receive stimuli. So she isn't able to receive the stimulus of, hey, this hurts. This is hot. This is cold. This is bruising me. Anything like that. So we went over the three functions of the nervous system. You should know that. <clears throat> nervous systems are built up out of specialized cells called neurons. Neurons also make up nervous tissue if you go back to the previous chapter when we talked about tissues and the four different types animals have. The neuron is a type of cell specialized for generating and conducting electricity. So it conducts electrical impulses and it's found in all animals except sponges because remember sponges don't even have tissues. Neurons are the building block of all nervous systems. You are born with 100 billion to 1 trillion neurons, but very few neurons are able to replace themselves. So in your skin, you can um, get a cut or whatever, and those skin cells are going to grow back. They'll regenerate themselves. 
Even your skeleton regenerates itself. You actually get a new skeleton on average about every seven years. But these neurons, they have very little regeneration capability. So even though you're born with a trillion, it seems like a lot. Um, you don't want to lose a single one. Each neuron has a cell body, which contains a nucleus and organelles like the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum, etc. What I want to talk about shown in this figure, though, is that there are two specialized structures in neurons, the dendrites and the axons. Dendrites are all of these tiny little projections. You can see it pointed out here in the figure. Dendrites sense and respond to stimulation from outside the cell and then send out information toward the cell body. Okay, so stimulus in here at the dendrites. The information is going to pass through the cell body and then down through the axons. Axons are very long tube-like projections that extend from the cell body and they transmit signals to other cells. So that's going to be signal in at the dendrites, signal out through the axons. And it makes sense that the axons are really, really long because they need to transmit that information, relay that signal down to muscles all throughout. There are three types of neurons. You should know that there are sensory neurons which collect information from the five senses. There are interneurons which communicate messages from sensory neurons to motor neurons. So these are kind of like the middleman. And then there are motor neurons which initiate a reaction to the communicated stimuli. Just reiterating the definition of a neuron, it's a type of cell specialized for carrying electrical signals in the building block of all nervous systems. Vertebrates nervous system consists of both the central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. You should be able to distinguish these two things and their subcategories. The central nervous system it's fairly self-explanatory. It's uh, diagrammed here in pink. That's going to be your brain and your spinal cord. But you also have all of these nerves coming off your spinal, your spine, um, spinal cord, which are going to comprise your peripheral nervous system. It's a network of sensory cells modified to receive information from the environment and motor pathways that transmit signals to effectors, the muscles and glands that are capable of responding to that stimulus. But the information received by the body's sensory cells does not generally go straight to the cells that control the muscles and glands. First, it passes through the central nervous system, which is made up of the spinal cord and brain. Not directly connected to sensory organs or to muscles, the central nervous system processes information that it receives from sensory cells about the organism's surroundings and sends out instructions to other nervous tissue to act in response to that sensory information. So information is going to be coming in and out to the nervous system through the peripheral, the central nervous system through the peripheral nervous system. Parts that comprise the central nervous system is the spinal cord, which is the column of nerves between the brain and peripheral nervous system. The brain itself, which is divided into three major parts that we'll talk about later, and then the brain stem. That connects the brain to the spinal cord. Within the peripheral nervous system, we have two categories, the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. Your somatic nervous system, in a nutshell, what it does is relay signals to your skeletal muscles and enables you to contract those muscles and move your limbs consciously. All right, so if I'm going to open and close my hands right now, that's the somatic nervous system because I'm relaying signals to my skeletal muscles consciously. 
There's also the autonomic nervous system, which relays signals to the glands in your body. So glands are things like your thyroid gland um, that are going to se be secreting hormones. And the autonomic nervous system also relays signals to your smooth muscle tissue and cardiac muscle. So these are bodily processes that are happening all the time that you're not consciously thinking of. That's the autonomic. The somatic, again, you are consciously moving those muscles. The autonomic nervous system can be subdivided further into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. You should know all of these terms. You can think of the autonomic nervous system as the automatic or involuntary nervous system. It carries the signals by which the central nervous system regulates heartbeat, breathing, gland secretions, muscles surrounding blood vessels that regulate circulation, and the movement of food through the digestive tract. It is the autonomic nervous system in large part that the central nervous system regulates homeostasis. Again, there are two components to the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for coordinating the body's fight or flight response to stress. So that response to stress would include increasing the heart and breathing rate, and it provides muscles with additional blood flow. The parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for controlling activities relating to digesting food and eliminating waste. It tends to slow the heart rate and breathing rates as these processes occur. Although the two systems tend to coordinate opposing effects, most muscles, organs, and glands receive input from both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so sympathetic is going to be your fight or flight. It's going to raise the heart rate and breathing rate. Parasympathetic is going to decrease the heart rate and breathing. Rate. So understand uh, the difference between the central and the peripheral nervous system and all of the subdivisions of them. The central nervous system is made of the spinal cord and brain, also the brain stem, which connects the two. The peripheral nervous system is the middleman carrying signals to and from the sensory and motor pathways. We have the somatic and autonomic nervous systems, which relay signals that can be controlled consciously, which would be somatic, remember, and then other signals that cannot be controlled consciously, that would be the autonomic. And then the autonomics further subdivided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So I talked to you about how neurons are the building blocks of the nervous system and they are specialized to relay electrical signals. So what does electricity have to do with our brains? Well, neurons work through tiny electrical impulses that are called action potentials. I unfortunately am not going to be able to go into what an action potential is for the sake of time, but they are tiny electrical impulses kind of zapping um, from one neuron to another to uh, cause a response to happen. The electrical impulses allow the body to regulate the nerve, nervous impulses to allow the body to work efficiently. So here I'm showing you, remember the dendrites are going to be receiving signal and then sending that signal down and out through the axons. So your neurons are linked up here, or three of them. They link up and they send information from one to another. Sort of like if you were playing telephone and there's a line of people and you're whispering something to the person behind you and you're playing telephone down the line. It's kind of like that. So the axon, uh, the previous neuron shown here, it's going to be releasing information through those action potentials to the dendrites of the next neuron. That neuron would then send that information down via an electrical signal, the axons to the dendrites of the next cell. And if we zoom in here, the place where the axon is interact of one cell is interacting with the dendrite of the next cell is called a synapse. 
And this is what's actually happening at the synapse. So how do these electrical signals get passed from cell to cell? Well, it's not electricity that's getting tra transmitted on. It's these things called neurotransmitters. So the electrical current, when it hits the end of the axon, is going to cause a release of neurotransmitters, which are chemicals, from the axon into the dendrite of the next cell. So now uh, understand axon versus dendrites, what the synapse is, and what neurotransmitters are. We're going to give some examples of neurotransmitters now. There are about 25 neurotransmitters that have been identified. There's four in particular that you may have heard of or you will hear about in your lifetime, I suspect. That is acetylcholine, glutamate, dopamine, and serotonin. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter released by motor neurons at the point where they synapse with muscle cells. So if you need to contract a muscle, neurons are going to send electrical impulses down and down and down until they synapse with a muscle cell and then they will release acetylcholine that says, hey, muscle, contract now. A practical example of this is Botox. So what does Botox have to do with neurotransmitters? Well, when injected into muscles, Botox blocks that acetylcholine filled vesicles to get to it. Okay? So you inject Botox into a muscle so that those motor neurons, when they release the acetylcholine at the synapse, it doesn't get to the muscle cell. So you're preventing the acetylcholine from getting to the muscle and you're thus paralyzing the muscle. So it's unable to contract because it needs acetylcholine to hit it to contract, right? If the acetylcholine can't get to it, then it can't contract, therefore it's paralyzed. So a tiny amount of Botox prevents a muscle from contracting for three or four months. That's why individuals have to keep getting Botox every so many months. So what they do is they go in, they get Botox, it's like a chemical, it's going to block that neurotransmitter acetylcholine and keep those muscles paralyzed so that they're not contracting a lot and forming those wrinkles. So tidy injections of Botox smooth lines in the forehead and reduce crow's feet wrinkles around the eyes. Because Botox essentially paralyzes muscles, however, it can lead to problems. So people that better stir Botox need to be pretty careful. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter that appears to be involved with learning and memory. Dopamine, I'm sure you've heard of. It's important in initiating coordinating movement. It's also one of the body's chief happiness neurotransmitters. So any drugs that are going to um, hit neurons in a way that they then release dopamine neurotransmitters, those are going to be what's responsible for making that high feeling happen. Serotonin is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that affects appetite, sleep, anxiety, and mood. It produces feeling of contentment and satiation when released. So a lot of people with um, generalized anxiety and depressive disorders have problems with serotonin being released properly at these synapses. So they will be taking medications that will aid in serotonin release. Okay, Botox inhibits the release of which neurotransmitter? Go ahead and pause this. The answer is number one, acetylcholine. Because remember the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is responsible for muscle contraction. And Botox essentially paralyzes those muscles in your face. Okay, we only talked about four, but there are 25. Understand these four. Now we'll talk about the sections or regions, if you will, of the brain. An adult human brain weighs only a bit over three pounds. It's fairly uniform in color. It's a drab, whitish gray, and the surface is soft and gently wrinkled. If you ever get the opportunity to hold a brain, it has a lot of grooves and wrinkles in it and is very squishy. It's not pink and it's not white, it is like a grayish white color. Each region of the brain is characterized by neurons that are shaped that slightly differently. 
meaning they have different axons and dendrite branching patterns. Also different parts of the brain, these neurons are going to use different neurotransmitters at their synapses. Each of these regions of the brain is the control center for various activities in the body. Max, the midbrain is here in the purple. The midbrain along with the medulla and pons of the hindbrain make up the brain stem. Most of the sensory information and motor neuron connections coming into and out of your brain pass through the midbrain. The midbrain helps filter and evaluate the importance of signals. It is greatly enlarged and plays a more significant role in cold-blooded animals such as fishes and frogs than it does in warm-blooded animals like us. So you should know the midbrain is a region, but it's not that important to memorize all those details. The hindbrain is important though, and here's the forebrain, it's also something you should know. In humans, the forebrain is the largest region of the brain. It includes two control and relay structures, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. It also includes the cerebrum. The cerebral cortex, which makes up the bulk of the cerebrum, is responsible for what we consider, quote, higher thought including perception, memory, language, intelligence, and personality. So you should know that. The thalamus is one of the primary switchboards in the brain. It receives most of the visual, auditory, and touch input. And it's going to be relaying information to the cerebral cortex. The hypothalamus is one of the chief regulatory centers of the brain. It regulates many fundamental drives including hunger, thirst, sexual activity, maintenance of body temperature, it also contains the hormone secretions of the tiny pituitary gland, which is located right next to it. The pituitary gland releases hormones that are important for reproduction and development. In the 1950s, James Olds discovered something very peculiar about the hypothalamus. So we're talking about the hypothalamus. When he inserted a tiny electrode into the hypothalamus of a rat's brain, the animal seemed to experience great pleasure. Of course, Olds couldn't be certain that it was pleasure the rat was experiencing, but he hypothesized that this was so by noting how the rats would work very hard to get the stimulation. So he could even get them to learn to run very complex mazes if at the end of it they got their hypothalamus stimulated because they really wanted that pleasure sensation. When he set up an apparatus shown here so that the animal could administer the stimulation to its own brain simply by pushing a lever, the rats became lever addicts, pushing the lever more than a hundred times a minute for many hours. They would even choose to push the lever over eating food or drinking water. With some rats starving to death, while pushing the lever rather than taking even a short break to eat. This discovery um, led to the understanding that the brain has pleasure centers or do it again centers. It was important because it revealed a mechanism by which animals could be motivated to engage in evolutionarily important behaviors by which they might increase their own reproductive success relative to other individuals in the population. Drinking when thirsty or eating when hungry produces stimulation in this brain area, thereby, thereby reinforcing behaviors essential to survival and reproduction. Now we'll talk about the cerebral cortex. Remember that it is the most sophisticated part of the brain, involved in abstract thought, problem solving, language, and personality. And it is the part of the brain most responsible for the traits that set us apart from other animal species. You may have learned about Phineas Gage in um, high school. I did in my psychology class, but bear with me if you have to hear it again. It's a very interesting story. One of the most dramatic demonstrations of the complexity of the cerebral cortex resulted from a tragic accident and apparently miraculous recover in eight, recovery in 1848. In the, at that time, a railroad worker named Phineas Gage was packing explosives into a hole when they exploded unexpectedly, blasting a three and a half foot iron bar right through his face, just below his left eye, through the front part of his head, and out through the top of his skull. 
shown here. Amazingly, he recovered from the accident. Soon after his recovery, though, it became clear that something in Gage's personality had changed. Before the accident, he was serious and industrious, but after the accident, he became vulgar, unpleasant, uninhibited, and irresponsible. Gage died about th 13 years after the accident, and his skull was preserved. Recent analyses of the skull indicate that Gage suffered from severe damage to part of his frontal cortex, and that frontal cortex is in the cerebral cortex. In other cases studied of patients with damage to the same part of their frontal cortex, such as that caused by certain tumors, uh, we see similar personality changes, with patients frequently exhibiting radically changed emotional responses. Um, so this was the frontal cortex, which is part of the cerebral cortex. If you've ever heard of lobotomies, um, this was something that individuals did to try and calm supposedly crazy people in, in asylums. They would surgically remove part of the frontal cortex to try and change their personality trait to make them uh, more, quote, manageable or normal. So if you've ever heard of lobotomy, which you probably have or you'll see it in a movie at some point, um, this relates to that. Here's the cerebral cortex, which we can break into further subdivisions. We know different parts of it is responsible for doing different things. The highly folded cortex is by far the largest brain structure covering all the brain except for the cerebellum. The cerebral cortex makes up 80 to 85 percent of the brain mass in humans with about 10 billion neurons and hundreds of billions of synapses. So know these different lobes with the frontal lobe, which is regulating speech, motor control, smell, problem solving, many aspects of personality. That's the area where Phineas Gage had damage done to it in that railway accident. The temporal lobe in the green perceives and processes auditory and visual sensation, which is important for pattern recognition and language comprehension. The parietal lobe receives and perceives receives and perceives touch and pressure sensations and then the occipital back here is important for visual information okay so temporal is going to be thought frontal is going to be personality occipital is going to be visual parietal is going to be um, touch so there are several distinct regions in the brain each of which is the control center for various activities of the body the hindbrain regulates basic physiological functions and the midbrain is going to be relaying information to the forebrain. The forebrain is the largest region responsible for what we consider higher thought. I want to zoom in on two areas here in the speech part of the brain, which would be in the um, temporal lobe. In its most broad interpretation, language is simply the means of communication between individuals of any species. In humans, language has evolved to its most complex level. Words and sentences allow us to convey not just simple information, but complex thoughts, such as things and events distant in space or time, something rarely if ever seen in other species. Several distinct brain structures, and two in particular, are necessary for the acquisition and use of language. One is required for the understanding of speech, including the linking of words with meaning. Located in the left temporal lobe, this region is Warnick's area. People with damage to Warnick's area, either from stroke or head injury, are able to produce sounds properly, such as when repeating things they hear, but they cannot understand speech and they can speak only gibberish. It's as if they have lost the ability to link words with their meanings. Okay, so Warnick's area is linking words with meanings. The second structure is Broca's area, which controls the muscles involved in the actual process of speaking. 
It is located in the front part of the left frontal lobe. All right, so this is uh, Broca's area is in the frontal lobe. Wernick's area is in the temporal lobe. The amygdala, amygdala and hippocampus seems to be important for memory storage. So these are located down here above the brain stem in the mid midbrain region. Uh, the amygdala seems to associate emotional feelings and sensory input with memories. And the hippocampus is important in the storage and retrieval of memories, as well as the transfer of short-term memories. All right, so we talked about the three broad regions of the brain, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. We then talked about the subdivisions in those three regions. We then talked about the forebrain cerebral cortex region, broke that up into the different lobes, that of which there are four of them, frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. And then within uh, and then we just focused on language and memory, which would be part of the frontal lobe, temporal lobe for language, and the midbrain would be the amygdala and hippocampus for memory. And I just want to end by saying, although brain science is still in its infancy, we are gaining a clear project picture of the brain structures that are chiefly responsible for these functions, primarily language structures in the left frontal and left temporal lobes and for learning and memory in the amygdala and hippocampus. President Obama put a lot of money, um, initiatives through the National Institute of Science for understanding the brain, for mapping our neuronal networks. It is a great unknown to us, our own brains, and how all of these neurons work together to form memories and language and all sorts of stuff. So hopefully we'll find out a lot more in the future. It's an exciting time for neurobiology. Have a good Thanksgiving, and there will be a lecture posted next week.